all influenza viruses are actually bird viruses. The 1918 virus infected about a third of the world's population. That would be equivalent to 225 to 450 million people dead today. Huge type face in the newspaper saying, wear a mask and save your life. This is in 1918. 1918 right? Wear a mask and save a life. What could have been done even at that time out of 1918 to have prevented something like this from happening? The most important lesson from 1918 is to tell the truth. If you don't tell them the truth, sooner or later, they're going to find out. We did masks, social distancing. What did we learn to prepare for the next one? You know, the cities that closed down earlier in the epidemic not only had better results in terms of how many people get sick and died, but their economies actually recovered faster and more strongly. We were not told the truth by Trump. Hundreds of thousands of Americans should be alive who are dead. And the reason is bad leadership. How are you processing this for yourself when you see the madness in DC? desecration of American democracy. Do you think things are just gonna escalate and get worse? Well, you keep thinking things are hit bottom and then they keep getting worse. Now you have people who are so committed to Trump, they believe anything that he says, outright lies. And then Fauci and Trump are going back and forth. So we're kind of like, who do we listen to? Do you listen to Trump? Do you listen to Fauci? If you do it right, you can contain even a disease as transmissible as this one. Countries have to tell the truth. My guest today is John M. Berry, who in the past, he's written many different books. He's an author and a historian, but he wrote a book that came out in 2004 called The Great Influenza, which in 2004, the National Academy of Sciences named it the Outstanding Book of the Year on Science and Medicine. And in 2020, it came back up the charts. Just to kind of give you an idea who's called them for counsel before in the past on the topic of influenza. It's both the Bush and the Obama, Obama administration. And Bill Gates once said, Barry will teach you almost everything you need to know about one of the deadliest outbreaks in human history. With that being said, John, thank you so much for being a guest today on Value Tainment. Uh, thanks for having me on. So Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year to you as well. And I know while we're doing this uh, uh, interview together, it's madness in D.C. And I know you used to work over there in D.C. before for quite some time. So how are you processing this for yourself when you see the madness in DC? With great displeasure. Uh, it's an under considerable understatement. You know, I know that building well. I practically lived in the Capitol for a decade. My wife worked in the Senate for more than 20 years, a little bit in the House. You know, every nook and cranny of that building I know, and to see it desiccate, uh, you know, I'm you know, it's, it's desecration of American democracy. Uh, to see that happen here is just off the scale. You, know? you ever seen it like this before for all the years you've been? Uh... Oh, God, no. I mean, you can go back to the anti-war protests in the 60s. I'm old enough to <laughs> live through that. I was in college then, and, you know, nobody did anything like that. You know, there were hundreds of thousands of people protesting. Uh, in the 60s, but but nothing like this disrespect for voting, disrespect for democracy, disrespect for the American way of life. I think those uh, congressmen and senators are traitors to America who are violating their oaths of office. And uh, it's, it's awful. How do you think this is going to end up? Because at this point, uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone's using the, the name, the title president elect. Obviously, if it goes the way it's going, President Biden and Kamala Harris, now it's House, now it's Senate. How well, I mean, you know, he's going to be president and she'll be vice president. There's no question about it. Uh, as they should be. They won the election. You know, the you know, over 60 court cases. You got to present evidence in court. You can't just make a speech and a claim. Sixty court cases lose every one of them. Republican leader of the state legislature in Pennsylvania, it's just Trump's lying. Republican U.S. senator, Trump's lying in Pennsylvania. Republican Secretary of State in Georgia, Republican Governor of Georgia, their lies. Trump's lying. Republican governor, Republican secretary of state in Arizona. They're all lies. 
the the person the Republican Trump hired to oversee election security says it's the safest, most secure election in American history. So Trump fires him. The you know Attorney General of the United States Bill Barr authorizes every U.S. attorney to look for voter fraud. Zero. You know the and Barr was was hated by Democrats. I think for good reason. I think he played the role not of representing the United States, but of representing uh, Trump. But even he says there's nothing wrong with the election. So he goes. Everything that they're saying is a lie. And, uh, you know, I don't understand how it got as far as it has in the Capitol. I just turned the TV on a little while ago. I would have thought they would have prevented those the breach. Uh, I, I guess they are, don't want to use force to prevent them from going forward because for fear that it would just incite the, much more. Yeah. Uh, but I think, frankly, I think the point is they're just about at the point where I would hate to see that tear gas in the U.S. Capitol or anything like that. That, that would just be beyond awful. Uh, but. You know, uh, uh, John, I, I'm a guy that came here from Iran. I lived there 10 years, two years in Germany at a refugee camp. And I've come into the States and I watch them, what's going on with politics in America. I'm noticing the Republicans are divided. Re Democrats seem to be divided. On the Democratic side, you got the AOC, Warren, Sanders camp, and then you have the Biden, you know, the rest of the uh, camp, and they're a little bit divided. Socialism, no, let's just stay Democrat. We don't need to go socialism. We can stay where we're at. And then on the Republican side, there's guys that are MAGA and there's guys that are Republican. And, and you know, on both ends, you almost see a little bit of turmoil. What do you think needs to happen for us to be a little bit more civil? Or do you think things are just going to escalate and get worse? Well, you keep thinking things are hit bottom and then they keep getting worse. I say I don't believe you can equate the divisions on the Democratic side with the Republican side. I, we were talking before we started the show you know, that I actually covered politics for 10 years. My first book was on politics. You know, I'm pretty liberal, but, you know, Newt Gingrich and I had a relationship. He was the first congressman I ever had lunch with in, in the 80s. You know, he called my first book. One of three, I'm not trying to promote it. I'll never see a penny in royalties from it. Never paid. <laughs> but, but he did call my first book one of the three best books ever written on Washington. You know, Back in the 80s, it was like two lawyers fighting in a courtroom, tooth and nail. Then they go out and have dinner. There were close friendships, close friendships uh, between people in both parties. We were talking early, you know, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan got along real well. Uh, Danny Rostenkowski, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and Bob Michael, the House Republican leader were were very very close friends uh you know and that has dissipated there's there's essentially none of that anymore I, the divisions on the on the democratic side are you know fairly standard you know they don't hate each other inside the, the party they disagree over the issues uh, they have always been like that. The Republican side has gotten a lot more extreme. Uh, you know, there aren't any moderates or very, very few people who would be considered moderate left in the Republican Party who were the classic fiscal conservative. Uh, they may claim to be, but, you know, they give away the taxes and so forth and so on. Uh, and now you have people on you know, who are so committed to Trump, they believe anything that he says, uh, you know, outright lies that have been disproved by every Republican. And yet the people are just committed to Trump. Uh, that's never happened in uh, recent, you know, I, I did drop out of grad school, almost got a PhD in American history. I'm going to say, is it never happened ever in American history? I look back and uh, 
I'm trying to think, go back, certainly not through the 20th century. Uh, I'm scrolling through in my head the 19th century. You know, there were people committed to Andrew Jackson, but not like this. Uh, John Adams, you know, when, when Jefferson was elected president, Adams wouldn't go to the inauguration. He left Washington in advance, but there was no question over handing over power. Uh, the, now, there, it's never been anything like this, and we've never had a leader in either party who incited followers the way Trump has done. Uh, you know, it's again, we didn't you didn't have me on to talk about this stuff, but. You know, it's happening in front of our eyes. And I was watching Fox, which I don't usually watch, but they were saying all the right things that this is a desecration of American democracy. This is not who we are. And yet it's happening here and it needs to stop. What do you think the 74, 75 million folks who voted for him are most upset about? Well, you know, they've been lied to ever since the election. So I don't blame them for believing some of the things that they've been told. You know, Tucker Carlson, for example, just to give you a single anecdote, you know, had this uh, thing on about somebody dead who was voting, uh, name, whatever the name was, John Doe, I don't remember. Well. A reporter went out and tracked that down and discovered it was a 95-year-old woman who used her, as some women do, they went by her husband's name, Mrs. John Doe. So it wasn't John Doe who voted. She signed in as Mrs. John Doe, and it was misreported as her deceased husband voting. Well, Tucker Carlson, in other words, there was no dead person voting. So Tucker Carlson makes a big deal out of claiming a dead person voting. He never corrected himself. He never issued a correction explaining, no, it turns out it was actually the widow signing Mrs. John Doe. So if you, that's what you see all the time, I, I'm not surprised that some people believe it. You know, for me, I'm, I'm a registered independent. I was a former Democrat. Then I went and became a Republican. Then I became an independent. Eight, nine years ago, I became an independent myself. Okay, And I can see from the outside myself. Uh, I think Clinton was a, uh, a good president. I think it was good for economy and him and Newt were good. I mean, it worked very good for America. I know Republicans probably didn't like Clinton and I know Democrats didn't like Newt, but they worked good together. You know, the whole conversation you and I were having with Tip and the Gipper, you know, the book written by Chris Matthews, how they worked together years ago where they would fight both Irishmen and, and they would have a beer together. Um, you know, I sit there and I wonder to myself, you know, when you say, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tucker Carlson comes out and he says that he doesn't go back and apologize and say that. I mean, that's being done by, by both sides where the Russia story you heard for three years and nobody ever came out and said that wasn't a true story. And then that came out and was an inaccurate story. I think both sides of the aisle got to take some responsibility. I don't put it on the politicians. I think media has divided America at the highest level and we're getting caught in the middle, fighting each other over them enticing more eyeballs to want to watch Fox and CNN to get more advertising dollars. What do you think about the role MSM's played, uh, mainstream media's played in dividing uh, many of us? Well, first, I wouldn't say there was nothing to the Russian deal. There was something there. Now, you know, maybe it didn't rise to the level of a felony, although. You know, that's questionable if you actually read the report. But, you know, we don't want to talk about that. I mean, Adam Schiff, uh, and Adam Schiff said for sure there is something, you know, the way he made it seem like it's guaranteed. I mean, you got to realize to use words like he used. I mean, all of us sat there and said there was some scandals with Russia. So, again, I just want to make sure. As well, we even uh, if you recall, Lamar Alexander, who did not run for reelection, but voted against hearing witnesses at the uh, Senate trial, he said, well, the reason he voted against witnesses was the Democrats proved the case. Now, whether you want to say it rose, the wrongdoing rose to the level of impeachment, you know, that's, that's arguable. 
uh, and a reasonable position to take. But, you know, again, we don't want to talk about that. I would agree with you that, you know, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, they, you know, like to cite because it does get clicks and or, you know, uh, clicks being the, you know, obviously sure. print I, media, you, yeah. know, you know what I'm, yeah, what I'm getting at. And I would like to see a little bit more reporting on that. Uh, I mean, just re- there's a lot of news that happens all the time that never gets reported because it's not exciting to get enough, but it's real, <laughs> has real impact on people's lives. And it's ignored because the latest, you know, outrage by one side or another is all they talk about yeah. on, on all three of the, those shows uh, or networks. Uh, you know, I would agree with with you there. For, 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 might not go as far as you go, but essentially in agreement. Uh, yeah. I'd be curious to know what happens with that, because I think on one end, you know, you most of us are emotional creatures, you know, so. So let's just say on both sides out of uh, 78 million, 74 million that voted, what percentage really did a lot of due diligence before voting? Let's just say 80% just voted emotionally, 20% research a little bit more. Out of the 20% that research a little bit more, say 10% of them extensively went into it to look at it. So media ends up controlling the majority of us because we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what's going on. So I, I, think, I think there's gotta be something about that because it's, Unfortunately, we are looking like fools to the world. Forget about us fighting each other. We're looking like fools to, if other countries are watching in right now, they're laughing, saying, look at what's going on to supposedly the greatest country in the world. Look how divided they are. You know, and anytime yeah. they're divided, you know, it's a very easy thing to come in, infiltrate. But, you know, let's let's talk about your book because I think that's, uh, that's the one thing I do want to spend some time talking with you about, specifically the great influenza, which, you know, Newt Gingrich said it's their third best book you know, he's ever read. And for him to say something like that. Well, he didn't quite say, well, I don't, I, you know, want to correct that. What he said was my first book, which was not the I'm sorry, I'm sorry, You're right. The, the book on, that was, yes, that was you're a book right. on Amer- on the Congress really uh, yeah. in the Reagan administration. You're talking about the ambition and the power is, that's is correct. Yes. So that, that's yeah. still for him to say that about a book that you wrote, but let's talk about the great influence of 2004. So, for some folks that haven't seen an interview of yours, I think you did some stuff with the folks at Library of Congress and other interviews you've done. What happened in uh, uh, with the great influence? If you want to kind of walk us through with the story and some of the stats so the audience can come up to date. Oh, you know, uh, uh, an animal virus, all influenza viruses are actually bird viruses. They all start in birds. So in a sense, they're all bird flu, but obviously they circulate in mammals. Uh, and a new bird virus jumped species to humans. Uh, we hadn't seen it before, or at least most hadn't seen it before. There are, there are eight gene segments in influenza. Seven of them came directly from birds. One may, it may have passed through another mammal before it got to humans on the eight. It spread worldwide very rapidly. You don't need airplanes to have a pandemic. There were pandemics that made it from Africa to Asia to Europe, even to the Americas going back into the 1600s. Uh, it infected about, the 1918 virus infected about a third of the world's population. It was much, much deadlier than COVID-19. And it killed between 50 and according to a Nobel laureate, uh, made this estimate in the 1940s and it's been confirmed by modern epidemiologists. Pr- probably between 50 and 100 million people died. Obviously, that's a big range. If you adjust for population, the world back then was less than a quarter of the size of today's world. So that would be equivalent to 225 to 450 million people dead today. Uh, so the worst, worst case scenarios for COVID-19, nothing like that. Uh, thank God. Uh, and, you know, so that virus was much more virulent. It, it also killed these people in an incredibly compressed period of time. Probably two thirds of the dead died in the fall of 1918. Uh, the pandemic stretched over a couple of years. 
in, in a particular city, it was even faster than that. It would probably be six to 10 weeks. Most of the people who died were uh, adults between the ages of 18 and 45 or 50, probably about two thirds of the dead. So that's very different from COVID-19 and very different from ordinary yep. influenza. Uh, possibly as many as 8% of the world's population, this would be on the worst case uh, of people in the age group, of that age group died in a matter of weeks. So it, it was pretty violent. And, and the Western world was at war. And because of the war, uh, every government that was fighting was focused entirely on the war. And for that reason, uh, governments tended to minimize the pandemic. In the United States, Wilson, the president at the time, never made a single public statement of any kind about this pandemic. Uh, and in an effort to, th there was a concern that any, that, that Wilson didn't want any bad news about anything, period. He didn't want any news that might hurt morale. This had nothing to do with the pandemic. They created an infrastructure in advance of the pandemic. Again, nothing to do with the pandemic. Something called the Committee for Public Information, a propaganda arm. The architect of that committee said, nothing in experience tells us that truth is superior to falsehood. The only thing that matters is its impact on what you say. So the government created this entity that was geared toward telling lies to keep morale up for the war. Uh, the government also passed a law that made it punishable by 20 years in prison to quote, utter, write, print, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language by the government of the United States. That law was upheld by the Supreme Court by Oliver Wendell Holmes and an opinion from two phrases from that opinion uh, survive. One is you don't shout crowd, fire in a crowded theater and uh, clear and present danger. And, and they, the government enforced that law vigorously. They sent a congressman sentenced to prison for 10 years, a congressman. You're kidding me. Uh, so this is a 1980. Now, so that's, yeah. So that's the context. On the one hand, and again, not prior to the pandemic, only because of the war, the government created an institution designed to lie to keep morale up and at the same time punish people for criticizing any action by the government. So there, that's the context that influenza arrived in. As a result, you have, there's no Tony Fauci in 1918. You had national public health leaders associated with the government saying things like, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was called Spanish influenza, although it didn't start in Spain. Uh, and they are, you have nothing to fear if proper precautions are taken. And yet people could die less than 24 hours after the first symptoms. And they could die with horrific symptoms. Uh, to probably the scariest would be they could bleed not only from their nose and mouth, but from their eyes and ears. That's a pretty frightening symptom. Uh, so people are, are dying in some cases with these horrible symptoms and in some cases very rapidly and a lot of people are dying and the government is telling you this is ordinary influenza by another name you have nothing to worry about i could you know go into greater detail but we're going to be talking for a long time so i'll let you ask some questions so john what how was the media at that time covering covering this i mean obviously we don't have the, the Fox, CNN, CBS, ABC, any, we don't have the kind of media that we have today. Who's, right. who's writing about it, opposing uh, uh, President Wilson while he's saying everything's fine, don't worry about it? Who's opposing and telling stories about what's really going on? Pretty much nobody in 1918. Uh, uh, you know, the, the newspapers in the country, uh, number one, they were patriotic and wanted to support the war effort. Number two, they had that law that I told you about a minute ago, that if you criticize the government, you could go to jail and a congressman was sentenced to prison. Uh, 
so in most cases, in most cities, the uh, newspapers simply went along with the program and printed lies. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, in Philadelphia, which was one of the hardest hit cities in the United States, hundreds are dying every day in Philadelphia, probably about 15,000 total. When they finally, and they're using steam shovels to dig mass graves, you literally have priests in Philadelphia driving horse drawn carts down the street, calling upon people to bring out their dead. So when they finally in Philadelphia closed saloons, closed theaters, closed schools and so forth and so on. One of the newspapers actually said a direct quote, this is not a public health measure. You have no cause for a panic or alarm, unquote. And yet people, you know, their neighbors are dropping dead. You know, there are mass graves being dug. They are using, reusing coffins because they didn't have any coffins. And the newspaper is saying, this is not a public health measure. So, I mean, how stupid did they think their readers were? The readers knew what was going on. Uh, I, Another example in, in Little Rock, you know, I, I quoted uh, a doctor in an in, uh, in army camp uh, a couple miles out, actually, I guess, seven or eight miles outside of Little Rock, uh, talking about thousands in the in the base hospital. The, you know, card is overflowing with with beds, beds outside the hospital. Uh, and he writes, there is nothing here but death and destruction. Just a few miles away in Little Rock, Arkansas, the Arkansas Gazette prints this big headline, Spanish influenza, same old chills and grip. And, and you know, it's just total dismissive, just like it, it was ordinary influenza. Uh, you know, th there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, there's a small city in Wisconsin where the uh, newspaper started to print the truth and the army started to institute prosecution against them uh, under that law I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, although the prosecution was dropped as the pandemic proceeded, uh, San Francisco is, is a, uh, was pretty exceptional. And San Francisco, uh, which got hit pretty late, actually, the uh, in you know, most cities, as I say, they're saying things like this is ordinary influence by another name. San Francisco, the mayor, the business leaders, trade union leaders, and the medical community all got together, signed a joint statement, huge typeface in the newspaper saying, wear a mask and save your life. Uh, this, is mask, in, this is in 18. This is in 1918. 19. 18, right? Wear a mask and save a life. Say, save your life. Save your life. <laughs> uh, uh, so that is a very different message than saying this is ordinary influenza by another name, which was the most common treatment of it in, in the press. Or a, a third example in Phoenix, they wrote a little bit about it when the disease erupted in Boston, which was the first place in the United States to get hit by the disease came in waves. And the second wave was the deadly wave. Um, so when it's in Boston, they write a little bit about it in Phoenix. When it's in New Orleans, they write less about it in Phoenix. When it's actually in Phoenix, it disappears from the newspapers. Not a word initially, uh, because again, they didn't want any bad news out there that might hurt the war effort. Now, eventually when it was impossible to ignore, uh, the Phoenix paper did start writing about it. But again, initially, to keep morale up and so forth and so on. Uh, they ignored it. You know, in other newspapers, they simply, they didn't even print names of the people who died. Uh, and, you know, all of this had a impact on the public and it wasn't what they wanted. Instead of keeping morale up, it hurt morale more than the truth would have uh, because people knew Again, their neighbors are dying. 
In some cases, the bodies are lying in the house for days because there's no one to get take it out. And they and people knew this was happening all around them. They knew that they were being lied to by the by the media and by the public officials. And all that did was alienate them and and cause them to feel that they had no one they could rely on except for themselves. Uh, and you know, it's sort of, sort of split society apart. John, uh, John, for you, did you ever sit down and have a conversation about this with your grandparents? Uh, I'm assuming your parents are probably born in the 20s or, or late teens. Actually, my mother just died at 102 and she was born in 1918. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Wow. Uh, but so when I first started working on the book, uh, you know, my grandparents were dead. Uh, but I had a, a, an aunt who was considerably older than my mother. Uh, and when I told her that I was working on the book, I mean, she sort of like grabbed her to her chest and said, oh my God, that, you know, that's the only time she ever saw her father to cry. That was because a couple directly across the street who had a couple of kids, you know, both of them died, uh, leaving several orphans. Um, which was not uncommon, because as I said earlier, the 18 to 45 is like the peak age, age at which people were dying. So there were a lot of orphans created. Well, that, that I was asking to, but by the way, sorry for your loss. I mean, it, it's, it's so interesting. You write this book, uh, 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 you know, The Great Influenza in 1918, and your mom's born that year. Uh, but, you know, it's always interesting when you talk to your parents and your grandparents. You know, when I talk to my dad and I said, Dad, what was it like? with the Shah's father versus the Shah when he was in charge, or what was Mossadegh like? And you're always curious, you know, to, to see what it was like during that season. But, you know, when you look back now, I'm sure, I mean, this is your topic. This is what you've written about. This is what you research. One, how was Woodrow Wilson judged, his legacy based on this? Did it at all impact his legacy? Because at that time, maybe we didn't have the media. And number two, looking back now, based on more experience that we have today, and having gone through a few other epidemics, pandemics in the recent decades, what could have been done even at that time out of 1918 to have prevented something like this from happening? Well, uh, first, thanks for your comment about my mother. Uh, you know, historians haven't written much about this. Uh, and it's hard to say exactly how Wilson was viewed because of the pandemic response. At the time, there was essentially no federal infrastructure uh, for, there was a public health service. There was no National Institutes of Health, which was actually created partly, in fact, primarily because of the pandemic, although not for a few years. Everything was handled locally anyway. Uh, and, it's, it's hard to say, you know, the war was so much more dominant in the news. It's hard to say how Wilson was evaluated or because of this. Also, we didn't have the notice that we had this time around. You know, there was a first wave in the spring. But at the time, it was almost not noticed at all. And, you know, for, for one thing, the virus changed and the first wave was very mild. I'll tell you how mild. There were over 10,000 soldiers in the British Grand Fleet, which patrolled the coast of Europe, which missed duty, who missed duty in the middle of a war to report for sick day bay with the first wave. Only four out of 10,000 died. That's pretty mild. That's how mild the first wave was. So that first spring wave, nobody paid any attention to. They were hit by surprise with the second wave. The virus became much more virulent, much deadlier. And the whole thing was over so fast. It wasn't really an opportunity to evaluate. Plus, medicine was much more primitive. The only thing that they did have in 1918 was the same thing that we have today. Social distancing, you know, hand washing, business closures, so forth and so on. But those were decided on a city by city basis, not even by uh, by governors. It was always up to the mayor and local 
You know, there were very few statewide closures. It was and is, almost is, all of them. I'm assuming that's documented, right? Meaning that it's easy for anybody to be able to research to see that it was city by city, not state by right. state. Right. Yeah, you can read in, in pretty much any local paper. It's it's always the, in, in 1918, it was always up to the mayor who, who made decisions. Uh, very few states. Uh, so the the I you know Wilson really wasn't judged on the performance of the federal government that and I, and again it was so fast one of the biggest differences between COVID nineteen and nineteen eighteen is the speed the two biggest differences are the virulence of the virus and the other is the speed of movement influenza is a much faster moving disease so as I said earlier in any particular city. The second wave was usually gone. You know, the whole cycle was six to ten weeks. Uh, so it was it was quite different in terms of evaluating the actions of the government. One of the reasons I got involved in pandemic preparedness was because what they call non-pharmaceutical interventions. What do you do when you don't have any drugs? Uh, was based on studies of what happened in 1918. And we did discover that, you know, the cities that closed down earlier in the epidemic before the virus was widely uh, disseminated in their populations and stayed closed longer, not only had better results in terms of how many people got sick and died, but their economies actually recovered faster and more strong and more strongly than uh, cities that that did not do that. Interesting. So, you know, looking there, looking now, what we experience, you're talking about here's a virus that is more of a, the R not score. It's more, you know, it can spread faster and people are dying within 24 hours. And in some instances, it's pretty ugly where it's not just bleeding, bleeding from the eyes and ears and it's a scary sight to go within 24 hours. And the ages you're talking about is 18 to 45, which is not necessarily the ages we're looking at right now. And then we look at COVID-19, what, what we experienced the last, say, 12 months. It's what, first week of January, December 27th is the first one they find out and comes here. It gets pretty bad in March and then it takes off. How do you think we handled it? Do we overreact? You think it was done the right way? You think we could have... Uh, you know, uh, uh, comparable with numbers to what happened with the influenza. It's nowhere near the numbers. We obviously any loss of a loved one to anybody who loves them. That's more than anyone ever wants to have. But statistically speaking, it's nowhere near that. How do you think it was handled with COVID-19 uh, and what we did the last 9, 10, 11 months? Well, of course, it varies country to country. So if you want to look worldwide, there's a tremendous range. Iran has not done very well. Uh, one of the reasons is the Iranian government lied to the public. I'm sure you probably know more about what's going on there than I do. Uh, in the United States, in terms of the developed world, I think we've done just about the worst. Again, because we were not told the truth by, you know, chiefly by Trump. You know why he made a decision to politicize masks. I mean, how is something as simple as that, a, how does that become a political statement? Yeah. Would, if you would, look at the countries around the world that have done well, yeah. it's not just, you know, you could say that Japan and Taiwan and Thailand and so forth, that those, their cultures are different. So maybe it's easier for them to do things as a community than it is for the United States. But look at Australia. Australia's culture is probably, in the sense of individualism and things like that, probably as close to the United States as any country in the world, maybe even including Canada. Uh, Australia has 25 million people, and they have just over 900 deaths. So if you adjust for population, 
that would be the equivalent of 13,000 deaths in the United States. Instead, we have over 350,000 deaths. So <laughs> you look at what Australia did and you look at our death toll and you can judge for yourself whether or not, you know, it's the same virus. We have the same tools to fight the virus. What's the difference? The difference is leadership and the way it's been handled. You know, the, and the economic impact has been much greater in the United States than it has been in Australia because, you know, they, you know, I mean, like airplane, the airplanes are flying overhead. I mean, they're flight jets, but not passenger. There's no government restrictions keeping people off airplanes. People aren't getting on an airplane because they don't want to be in an enclosed space, even though actually the circulation in an airplane is very good and it's, it's shouldn't be that scary, but that's why the airplanes, nobody's traveling. It's not because of government regulation. Uh, so I would say we've done a very, very, very poor job. Any uh, specific areas, like, because when you talk about masks, like I remember when Fauci first came out on 60 Minutes in March, he said, masks are not effective, you know, and if you wear them, it's not going to be that effective. And you know, you know, and then uh, uh, when Trump's about to shut down China, Pelosi goes to China, say, hey, it's not fair, it's racist. Why are you shutting down China? It's not, you know, we're, it's not a big deal. We should stay open. And then Biden comes back and says, it's, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. And then he turns around and says, was the right decision made? And then, and then Fauci and Trump are going back and forth. So we're kind of like, who do we listen to? Do you listen to Trump? Do you listen to Fauci? Do you listen to Michael Osterhelm? Who do you listen to? And then do you, and everybody starts reading your book. Let's find out what can we learn from 1918. So what I'm curious about is, it, it, you know, it seemed like from the beginning, Fauci and Trump were not on the same page. So which part of the area, because I don't think this is the last time that we're going to have another uh, uh, epidemic, pandemic. I think you agree right. with that. I think there's going to Absolutely. Be so my yeah. biggest concern is I'm 42 and I run multiple businesses. I got three kids, one on the way. And these are young kids, eight, seven and four. And so. If in the next time a pandemic happens, what set of standards do we hold that president? Is that president automatically going to panic, whether he's a Democrat or she's a Democrat or a Republican, and they're going to say, shut it down. Don't shut it down. You should shut it down. What if this? Well, no one's died yet. Why are we going to shut it down? So I'm worried the way we handle this one is going to put the other president in such a corner where they almost have to make certain decisions that could impact the economy again. So I'm looking for more since this is something you're an, I'm not an expert in this area. You are. Okay. What, well, let what me see. Okay. You know, first, let me talk specifically about masks and I'll talk more generally. Uh, initially, I, you know, was on, you know, I was on all the networks, even including Fox. Uh, and I was saying, no, masks aren't any good. And that was based on influenza. And it was based on 1918. Now, even in 1918, they actually ran very good experiments that hold up today. And they could tell you how far respiratory droplets travel and so forth. And they found in 1918, they knew that putting a mask on someone who was sick was very helpful in protecting people around that person. But they did not find that putting a mask on healthy people was for the general public was useful. Based on that data, which I was very familiar with, and I don't know how familiar, Fauci actually knows a lot of history. Whether he's familiar with that specific data, I'm not sure. Right. But it, at least my own position was based on data. That changed because influenza has essentially no asymptomatic transmission. It does have transmission before you get symptoms, you can uh, transmit the disease, but it's for a relatively short period of time. Then we discovered that this disease has a lot of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. That changes the equation on the masks. So you get new information, you change your position if you've got a brain. Uh, so specifically on masks, there's that. On the more general point, 
you know, the, the reason I was asked to get involved in the pandemic preparedness stuff under the uh, Bush administration was again, because of my knowledge in 1918. And my message in many meetings was always the same. The most important lesson from 1918 is to tell the truth. When the only weapons that you have to fight the disease are going to be public health measures, they're not going to work if the public is not going to listen to your advice. And unless the public believes what you're telling them, they're not going to listen. If you tell them the truth, if you don't tell them the truth, sooner or later, they're going to find out. And you, once you lose your credibility, it's gone. Uh, you tell them the truth and you hope they comply. In those early meetings, you know, going back to 2006, 2005, maybe even, we were unanimous in those meetings that no politician, not the president, not the secretary of health and human services, no politician should be the spokesperson. We were unanimous in those meetings that to retain your credibility, you wanted to have a scientist or you know a physician. And the perfect guy, this is before your time, uh, but going, we were talking about the Reagan administration earlier, Everett Koop, who was the Surgeon General in the Reagan administration, he would have been the perfect person as a spokesperson. Uh, I don't know if you remember anything about him at all, or how many of your viewers remember. It's a long time ago; it was 40 years ago. But since we didn't have Everett Koop, that if a pandemic happened then, when we were in these meetings, we figured Tony Fauci would be the best guy. And Tony was not a member. You know, I know, I know I'm not well, but I know him. We have a lot of mutual friends. Uh, Tony was not in those meetings. Uh, we weren't scientists. We, we were public health people and so forth and so on who were, who were you know, not lab scientists, which he is primarily. But we all felt that he was the guy. Uh, so, you know, the CDC, you know, somebody for, should be the spokesperson who comes out of the scientific community and can retain the credibility. Because no matter how popular any president is, and no matter how much truth he's committed to telling, in the best case, 30% of the American public are not going to believe anything he says. Sure. And in the worst case, 55% aren't going to believe him. So that's why you don't want a political figure. So that's the number one lesson which was violated by this administration. And worse, you know, they, as we know now, he told Bob Woodward on February 7th, he knew that this was a deadly virus and he knew that it was airborne and all this stuff. And he just didn't tell the public the truth. He politicized, the irony is that I think if he had handled the pandemic half decently, he'd have been reelected. You know, you lived in Germany, Merkel's approval ratings went through the roof, the highest she ever got. She was in her approval ratings because she was very forthright. She's a you know, a physicist, as, as you know, is her background. She was telling the German public the straight dope from day one and her popularity went through the roof. The only time in, in Trump's presidency that he cracked 50% in the approval rating was back in March when he said we're at war with the virus. People want to rally around a leader in a crisis. And if he had maintained that tone Instead of trying to minimize it, I think, and if he had done a better job, you know, number one, I think it would be a lot fewer Americans dead. And number two, it would have been better for the economy. And number three, it probably would have reelected him. But he chose not to go that route. He's very short sighted. He likes to win the day without looking at the month, much less the year. 
So on any given day, maybe it was better to tell somebody the equivalent of this is ordinary influenza by another name, which is essentially what he said. Uh, over a period of time, as the death toll mounts up, you know, that came back to, to on him. John, um, question with you regarding when I was going to the future, my concern is the next one. We're going to have okay. a So let's talk about now what the next one before we wrap up is what, what did we learn now? What to do with the next one? We like, I tell you, me as an amateur, okay, we thought it took, even Fauci said it takes at least 18 months to come out with a vaccine. Well, we were able to do it faster than that, right? So that was impressive. We came right. out with it, I don't know, nine months, which I, I didn't think it was going to come out in nine months. Pretty impressive. A week after election, boom, Pfizer says we have a 94 and a half efficacy. Moderna comes out 95% efficacy. And then you, you got the Pfizer says we're 95.5, whatever. But anyways, we have a vaccine that comes out, right? right? Okay. We did masks, social distancing. What did we learn to prepare for the next one? Airports, travel. You said something earlier about influenza that you don't need airplanes to have a virus. You can do it through birds. So just maybe talk from your standpoint of preparing for the next one. Well, I, again, I think the same lessons that came out of 19 are confirmed by this one. Number one, tell the truth to get your public, the public on your side. Certainly don't divide the public. Tell the truth, keep a consistent message, have a credible spokesperson. That's all sort of the same thing. Number two, these so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions work. They work better than any of us ever imagined. You know, I supported them, but based on the 1918 experience, I was kind of skeptical, skeptical about how well they would work. But we have learned, much to the amazement of the public health community, that if you do it right, you can contain even a disease as transmissible as this one. And this is more transmissible than influenza. You know, I, I cited, uh, you know, Australia a few minutes ago. They have fewer than 1,000 deaths in the, out of 25 million people. That would be the equivalent to 13,000 deaths in the United States. Taiwan hasn't had a case of influenza since eight, of COVID-19 since April 13th. You can do it right. We didn't. It's that simple. But those are the lessons that it is controllable. The other thing is the technology. We, you know, because the Bush administration really started this massive program to prepare for a pandemic, they expected it to be influenza, but it applied to any respiratory disease. Part of that was creating, uh, putting money into basic scientific research on vaccines. And as a result, that's why we were able to get the vaccine so quickly. They, there was an infrastructure, there was a platform of how to make a vaccine that could be applied to basically any virus. Uh, and they just plugged in the genetic code for the spike protein into this platform that already existed, that had been developed. You know, hopefully in the future, we'd be able to do it again, but not every virus is as susceptible to a vaccine. You know, we've been working on a vaccine for HIV for, you know, 35 years, and we haven't gotten there yet. Same thing for influenza. We've been looking, working on a vaccine for influenza. We have vaccines, but they're not nearly as effective as the one against COVID-19. Uh, so improving the basic science, getting... Uh, investing in basic science, investing in the public health infrastructure. That's one of the reasons why the vaccine rollout is so screwed up is because there is essentially no public health infrastructure. Again, another basic scientific investment in broad spectrum antiviral drugs. Uh, we originally thought that we would have drugs that worked against COVID-19 before we got a vaccine we really don't have any effective drugs yet, except for dexamethasone, which, which helps significantly, but that's a long way from a magic bullet. Investing in that area of research, you know, further investments, vaccine and public health infrastructure and telling the truth. I think those are the, the main lessons. 
that and maybe throw in one other thing, and that's surveillance for new viruses. Uh, you know, the biggest concern had always been an influenza pandemic like 1918. The World Health Organization did create a worldwide surveillance system looking for new influenza viruses. Uh, so the alert alerted very early in the process. Uh, you know, that needs to be expanded. And again, countries have to tell the truth. China did not tell the truth in SARS. They improved a lot when we were concerned about bird flu. They did not tell the truth in COVID-19. And they're still hiding it. You know, just I think it was yesterday, they're still negotiating. Earlier, they had agreed to allow WHO investigating team into the country to try to track down the source of COVID-19. And yesterday, it turns out they're not letting that team in. They're, quote, negotiating, unquote, over what they're going to do. So they're still not willing to tell the truth in China. That's very helpful, by the way. I mean, what you said was very helpful. Uh, you know, how, how much of this, from your point of view, I, I think you're in, in this area, you know, you're holding Chinese's, uh, China's foot to the fire and Trump's foot to the fire, Wilson's foot to the fire. Wilson was a Democrat. Trump's a Republican. China's somebody that's a very controversial country right now because both on the left and the right. And I, I guess my question for you in this will be because when you said the influenza wasn't uh, decided by the governor or uh, Wilson. It was the social distancing and the mask was left alone to the mayors. And you said a lot of that is documented that you can find it. How, how much of what we experienced the last nine, 10, 11 months would you say is the responsibility of China? How much is Trump? How much is the governors of states for states like California? And I'm originally from, I lived in California 24 years. I came to Texas. How much of it is China? How much of it is Trump? and Fauci and his administration, how much is uh, uh, the state's governors on how they handled it themselves? I'm curious because as somebody, you're starting to notice, I was in Florida last week looking at homes and Florida, my realtor said something very interesting to me. He says, Patrick, I know you're coming here looking at homes. I just want you to know, this is the wrong time to negotiate. I said, what do you mean? He says, it's not on your side right now. Don't negotiate with the seller. I don't understand what you mean by that. That's what buyers and sellers do. He says, you're right, except he's got 50 offers because so many people from New York are moving to Florida. The leverage is not on you. The same with Texas. I put my house on the market two years ago, John. When I put on the market two years ago for one year, I got nothing, zero offers. I put the house on the market three weeks ago with the plans of selling it in six months. 24 hours, I got two cash full price prices. I wasn't planned. I wasn't ready for that. We have to move out of our house. So I'm saying this to you because Again, I think what we learned as well by states is you got to also look at how your state handles it. I want to hear your thoughts. So is the blame more on China? Uh, should they go through the tribunal role and be held to, at the courts to see how they're going to be held accountable? Is it President Fauci or is it governors? What would you say? Well, in terms of China, I, I don't want to allocate percentages, but, you know, this is not a virus that was put together in a laboratory. That's crystal clear. There's not a scientist in the world worth his salt who believes that, I don't think. In terms of could it have been an accidental release? Well, it's almost impossible to prove a negative, but there's no evidence whatsoever that that is the case. But you can't really prove that that's not the case. You know, it's theoretically possible, but highly unlikely. That's a skilled laboratory in Wuhan. They know what they're doing. Very, very, un and no evidence that they were working on this virus. You know, could China have contained the virus and prevented it from getting out? Well, that involve, would have involved, you know, that's also theoretically possible. If everything worked perfectly and China came down on it with the same hammer that they did on, I guess, January 23rd or 24th when they closed Wuhan. It's theoretically possible. Might not have been possible because that virus, you know, it takes a while. It starts, it crosses the species barrier. It starts to circulate in humans. 
it's not recognized immediately. People have to get sick and go to the hospital before it's recognized at all. You know, and particularly with a relatively long incubation period, as long as 14 days, people at Wuhan's 11 million people. They're traveling all over the world without knowing that they're sick, without, you know, so I don't think it could have been contained. So, uh, you know, the blame for China, you know, the H1N1 turned out to be a very mild virus, but when it first started, the so-called swine flu from 10 years ago, you know, the initial reports were 10% case mortality. So that looked pretty scary. You know, was that Mexico's fault? No, it wasn't Mexico's fault. It could have happened anywhere in the world. There is evidence that the 1918 virus started in the United States. And I put that in my book, although since my book was published, I actually think it started somewhere else. So, you know, China's hard to figure out. Certainly, they have not been forthright. But the people who suffered most from that were their own people. You know, and, and the, the doctors that they put in, in, you know, there were four of them, one of whom died, uh, who were trying to get the truth out. Uh, you know, so let's move from, from there to Fauci. Uh, you know, he's not perfect. None of us are perfect. You know, I said the same thing he said about masks. We talked about that earlier. The data changed. The information changed, so you change your opinion. Uh, I think the the CDC's failure on testing, which is a huge failure, that was not Trump's fault. He may get the blame for it because it's his administration, but that didn't rise to the level of you know, the White House when they were in the first weeks of tracking the virus in the United States. You know, clearly it was circulating before we realized it was circulating. Uh, in terms of acting on closing borders and things like that, you know, closing borders can slow the spread of a virus if you get it very, very, very early, but it depends on the virus. If it were influenza, because the incubation period is so much shorter, it wouldn't have made much difference. There were studies that, uh, models that showed, this is prior to this pandemic, if you were 99% successful in closing a border against an influenza virus, it would delay the, the spread of the virus and its arrival in your country by three weeks. That's not worth doing because of the economic disruption. But this virus moves much more slowly. Again, one of the biggest differences between COVID-19 and influenza is the incubation period and then the serial uh, infection after one person gets sick, then the next person gets sick, then the next person. You know, so whether it makes any sense to close the borders depends on the virus. Uh, in influence, I don't think it would. As it turned out, but we didn't know it at the time, it would have helped initially with this virus. Uh, but once the virus gets going inside your country, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, in terms of the 357,000 deaths at the latest count as we're taping this, you know, how much of that is Trump's fault? And I'm not going to give a percentage, but I would, as I said earlier, and you know, you look at Canada on a per capita basis, much lower death toll. You look at Australia, as I said earlier, an infinitely lower death toll. Yeah, that's on Trump. We could have and should have done much, much better. Before this pandemic, the World Health Organization rated pretty much all the countries in the world and their pandemic preparedness, the United States came out number one. Supposedly, we were the most prepared country in the world. But we didn't use it. You know, the idea, you were talking about governors and, and mayors and so forth. 
you know, the failure to use the Defense Production Act, the idea that states were bidding against each other for, you know, the PPEs. That's crazy. That should have been done by the federal government and then allocating based on need. You know, in terms of closing individual cities down versus the governor, you know, you had in Georgia, you know, the mayor of Atlanta wants to close the, the city down. Georgia's forbidding that from happening. Uh, similarly, there were tensions between mayors and the governor in, uh, in Florida and, and probably elsewhere. I know in Louisiana, there wasn't a tension, but the governor of Louisiana, the, the state of Louisiana was much less aggressive than the city of New Orleans. New Orleans at one point where I'm sitting, at one point we had the highest growth rate of cases in the world in the spring. And the mayor shut down, New I live in the French Quarter, or, you know, the bars never close here and the bars were closed. I think New Orleans has done a lot better than most places in the South because we had aggressive leadership from the mayor. There's credit, I would rather have credit go around than blame go around. But I don't think there's any way of getting out of this without saying at a minimum tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of Americans should be alive who are dead. And the reason is bad leadership. One of the things I, I struggle with, I had Nude on a couple months ago, maybe maybe six weeks ago, I had Nude on. I think I just spoke to a, a Dr. Cyril Wecht, which you would probably know who he is. He's the pathologist, uh, uh, you know, award-winning pathologist, you know, 21,000 autopsies. He's the one that came out 1972, first one to hold John F. Kennedy's brain, a civilian to do that, a doctor. And many times when I sit down and I talk to folks, obviously, you know where they're at politically. If I talk to Gloria Allred, which we've had her on, you know which way she leans. If I talk to Newt, you know which way he leans. If I speak with President Bush, you know which way he leans. If I speak to you, you know which way you lean. I, if, I, if I speak to anybody where politics are involved, you know which way they lean. One of the things that you know, I, 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 I struggle with is things that we're not on the same page with. I'm confused why the left and the right is not on the same page when it comes down to China. That confuses the hell out of me because you know, I get it if you say, well, it's Trump's fault. Okay, I get it if the right says it's Fauci's fault. He kept flip-flopping and changing. Okay, no, it's Trump's fault. At the end of the day, everything rises and falls on leadership. You can't dispute that. That is exactly what the, you can't say it's not my fault. You're the president. Everything falls on you. Fine. Yeah, okay, where you brought up uh, the gentleman's name who worked with Reagan. I think he was the one that was in, he was uh, the third yeah, one. Coop. He, Coop. He, he was the one yeah. that was leading the AIDS uh, uh, right. pandemic, right? That's what he was doing. Right. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's great. You're, that's a good playbook that we have on what to do. But, you know, the, 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 the one part is, um, on one end, you're saying they're trying to negotiate that people come on on site and go and look at to see what happened with the pandemic. To yeah, see it's ridiculous. It. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. And then at the one time, one of the uh, a journalists, kind of like you, a lady comes on and says, look, this virus is deadly. And she's now getting jailed for four years just because she told the story and the truth. And now she's going right. to prison for that. I don't know. That's the one part that concerns me. I get we have differences on policies. Pro-life, pro-choice. Fine. I get that we say... NRA, guns, we need more, you know, uh, background checks. Sure, I'm military, I get it. I, we do need to have, more people need to be trained when they have guns. But there are certain things we gotta be on the same page with. Our enemies, it, it, it doesn't care if you're left, right, or the middle. You know, they, they want to take control of US if they can, and China and Russia are both enemies. Uh, so my challenge becomes how they're gonna be held responsible for this. Uh, more than anything else. I don't think that's a political message. I think that's a left, right, middle. I think that's a red, white, and blue message of us yeah. being on the same page with that. So anyways, uh, I, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts. If you have a rebuttal for that, I'd love to hear it. Well, it's more an agreement. I'm Well, you know, I mean, they didn't create the virus. They didn't try to infect the world with it. Yeah. Uh, they mishandled it. There was no but so did a lot of other countries. So when you talk about liability for what is a natural event, that's, that's pretty tricky. For we, their political the actions, yeah. I mean, what they're doing in Hong Kong, 
Uh, no, what, know, I'm just, saying just, is, what I'm saying is we haven't even been able to go out there and do our own research and due diligence on it. Right. It's kind of like, well, now you're not welcome here. and There's no free press. Yeah. We don't have a CNN, Fox, ABC, CBS, NBC over there no. to find out what's going on. We don't even have a social media. It's a secret what's going on over there. So that's why I don't I don't know if we're ever going to get to the bottom of it to find out really what they did and what their involvement was. I think both sides are assuming the sides that say it's their fault and the sides that are saying we don't know if it's their fault or not. I think we need to investigate and I don't think they're going to let that happen with us. Well, again, what do you mean by fault? You know, I, I don't the I idea think, that they, you know, what would have been the difference? Let's say on January 8th, instead of January 10th, the world got the genetic information on uh, this virus. Or let's say they got a, a, you know, there's some indication that it was even earlier than that, that they had the genetic code. By earlier, we're talking about a few days earlier. What difference would that have made in terms of the world developing the vaccine? It wouldn't have made any difference. Are you kidding me? I mean, everything is about momentum. Everything is- Well, you're talking about, we're talking about four or five days earlier that they might have released a genetic code. If I'm, I guess an, it, if I'm an ally with you and you're making $550 billion of tax revenue off of me every year because of import-export, I would expect you to tell me the second you find out anything. Now, if for, a, a, a day is too long for me. We're allies. I'm making you a half a trillion dollars a year. On I'm import. not saying they were right to withhold it. Yeah. But when you're talking about holding them, making them liable, what are the damages that resulted from a delay of four or five days in releasing the genetic the damages code. are the 50 million uh, people that were working in the restaurant business that are unemployed right now. And uh, the jobs of a uh, beer, alcohol, all the regular people that have regular, but the same jobs. thing with the same, it wouldn't have stopped the virus from spreading around the world. If, if I'm an ally to you, if you and I are married to each other, husband and wife married to each other, Hey, when something happens, tell me about it. We're an ally. We are in bed. When we, when you become business partners with somebody, and you have any kind of material information that's going to affect the company that we own together, you got to tell me about it. And we're I business. agree with that. I'm done. Yeah. I'm so, just asking yeah. you if they had, for example, released the genetic information four or five days sooner. See, would see, there have been any difference in what happened? Now, I don't really, I actually, you know, you could argue maybe Pfizer would have ended up releasing, you know, announcing that they had a vaccine results before the election instead of after the election. That could have affected the outcome of the election. Uh, So from Trump's perspective, the four or five days may have made a difference in terms of the death toll or the efficacy of the vaccine. It wouldn't have made any difference. That's not at all what I'm asking. Just so you know, I'm not at all asking about the election. That's not, that's not like the last. Yeah, I, I hear what you, you know, do I think China handled this right now? I think they lied yeah. and they're still hiding stuff. You know, we thought they had learned their lesson after SARS. They didn't. Why are you we- know, they were very cooperative yeah. on, on bird flu. And this thing comes along and they go back to the way they were with SARS. You know, my, my biggest thing is why are we why are we making giving them a pass here? I don't understand why we're giving them a pass. That's the part that uh, deeply concerns me when we're giving them a pass, knowing they're celebrating New Year's in Wuhan, doing backflips with tens of thousands of people outside, and the most incredible place to be on New Year's Eve, which is New York, watching a ball drop. If you've ever been there, it's magical. And our folks are not out there. We're all home, afraid, going to sleep at 1145, which is pathetic. That's not the American way. You know, and I'm not I'm not even an I'm an immigrant. I wasn't even born here. I'm talking about the American way. So what I will say about you, John, I I became smart in the last 84 minutes because of you. And I appreciate that. And I'm grateful for your time. Uh, And, you know, I I don't know why you said earlier, I will never see a penny of it if people buy the book. Why did you say that? I get. You said that quickly, and I didn't oh, get the it's a, Well, no, I'm depends on the book. We were talking about my first book, which is oh, out of print. So the it. only way you can get it. it is used I from a used it. bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> so I will never see that. I got it.
Okay, fair okay. enough. But the great influenza, you are going to see. Oh, that's in print. Yeah. Okay, that's, sounds yeah. good. So <laughs> if, if if the audience is watching this and you've never uh, uh, bought the book, if you haven't, many have. We're going to put the link below for people to order the book. John, do you want to give us a, a thirty second your thoughts uh, on the future? How do you how do you think uh, the future looks? Are you optimistic about the future? I'm very optimistic. I think uh, in in terms of the vaccine. Uh, there is, as I'm sure you know, uh, the mutation in the virus, which makes it more transmissible. And that's a little bit scary. Right now, it, it looks like the vaccine will still be very effective against that virus. Uh, so we're in a race between getting the vaccine distributed and the spread of that virus. I think the polling has improved in terms of people who are willing to take the vaccine. And I think that will continue. Uh, I got vaccinated a couple of days ago, actually. Uh, I didn't jump any lines. Uh, I'm old enough that in Louisiana, if you're over 70, you got it. And I just happened to get lucky in terms of getting, uh, signing up on a website before it crashed, crashed right after I signed up. Uh, <laughs> So, so, you know, the vaccine works. We also, in terms of the longer term future for the next pandemic, and as you said, you expect more and, you know, I mean, there's a virtual guarantee there will be future viruses jumping species from animals to humans. You know, we do know two things. We've improved our scientific infrastructure so that we can get a vaccine faster than anybody ever imagined. And it still took nine, 10 months, and it's going to take more months before you distribute it. So you're still in a best case. You're going to take at least a, a, you know, a year, 18 months after a virus enters the human population before you get a widely distributed vaccine. That is the best case because the production and distribution you can't really accelerate beyond what we've already done so the other thing that we learned from this is how to handle it properly uh, the question remains whether or not whoever is in leadership will make the right decisions for 15 years, I went around giving talks, and I ended up pretty much the same way that we know what to do, but the person making a decision is going to be above the pay grade of some public health commissioner. And will that person listen to the scientific advice, or will they be making a short-term political calculation? And that is going to remain the question into the future because that's the human equation is always going to factor into it. And I'm not dissing the impact on the economy. You know, that is part of what you weigh when you make these decisions. But they should be made for the benefit of the society and not a short term political calculation. Uh, and again, that's going to be up to the individual who's in a position of power, and that's unpredictable. I hope the right people are doing so much research and reading books like yours to be prepared for the next one, because if we don't learn our lessons from this one and repeat it again, that just shows a lack of leadership and lack of research and lack of preparation. And, and uh, that's not OK. You know, in business, we say you can make mistakes. And that's okay. New mistakes are fine. So repeating the same old mistakes is ludicrous. And I hope we don't make that both as a society, as a country, as a leadership at the top. And obviously the people that are involved um, who are making the decisions with help as far as the folks in the Fauci community and CDC. So, John, with that being said, thank you again for your time. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed it, too. Thank you. You're very welcome. So what do you think about the discourse, the back and forth, the China, the story of what's going on in D.C. with Republicans, Democrats, Fauci? There was a lot of things that we covered. I'm curious to know what you took away from that part. And 
If you enjoyed this interview, if you watch the whole thing and you enjoyed this interview, I think you can also enjoy the interview I did with Stephen Gundry, top cardiologist in the world. And if you've not watched that, click over here to watch that. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.